All right, I see Renee's on my screen. So Renee, can you tell me if you can see my screen okay? I can. All right. So the agenda for today's meeting, Renee, I think you were gonna take that one on. Yes, uh, thank you. So yes, today's agenda, we're gonna be going over some of the updates to the FY24 MOU. Uh, so we can kind of highlight some of those updates before we sent it out to you to have you review and sign. Uh, we'll be going over the FY24 funding and grant award notifications, substantial and final approvals, obligation of funds, uh, some FY24 strategic, strategic plan application updates, including leadership team meetings, required documents, root cause analysis, five whys, smart goals, and the coaching comments. Uh, monthly meeting year at a glance. Uh, the August continuous improvements uh, cycle and CNA talk, which was uh, what today's about. And then monthly principal and coach meeting poll at the end of this session. All right, so we're gonna get started by sharing with you some FY24 updates to the MOU. And the MOU is a memorandum of understanding that is required for us to send out and have all stakeholders review, understand the expectations and sign off on. I am going to actually bring that up onto the screen as I go over it. So there is a lot of information on it. Um, we're not gonna go over everything because you'll have the opportunity to review it at your own convenience. We're just gonna highlight some very key areas. Renee, can you now see the MOU? Yes, I can. Okay, so the first key area is being able to highlight this colorful section here, which is the Grants for Me Strategic Plan Workflow. That is something that you really do need to understand as you apply for the funding that has been awarded to your school. When we get money from the federal government, at, we are considered a pass-through entity, and we award that money out as it is being meant to be awarded out. And when we do that, we're awarding money specifically to a school under school improvement guidelines under the Title I uh, statutory regulations. And the person who initially completes the application that's going to show how that money is spent is the principal and the leadership team that that principal um, organizes. Once it goes through that process and you've got the, the strategic plan application completed as far as which level of approval you're seeking, and we'll get into that in further detail a little bit later in this presentation, it goes on to your business manager for review with a fiscal lens, because the business manager knows fiscal responsibilities the most. So that person will review and make sure that all of the money has been obligated into the right funding streams in order for reimbursement to occur. And then it needs to go through the approval of the superintendent who oversees uh, everything within the district. Once it gets through the review and approval of those three people within a school and district, it then comes into our queue. And at that point in time, the green section, that's the MDOE, we give ourselves a two week window to be able to review applications and either provide feedback or give the whatever level of approval the application is seeking. Now we give ourselves that two week turnaround time, but we do try our best to get it done earlier than that because we know how important it is that you have access to these funds and you can begin obligating. So we want to make sure that we are giving ourselves a reasonable timeline because 
at certain times of the year, we get an influx of applications. And then at other times, we have more flexibility and can review them sooner. So that's what that workflow is. The second thing I want to point out on the MOU is the substantial and final approval of the application. This is something new at the school level. We are adopting the same model that we utilize at the district level, which is actually going to streamline the process better and make your funds more readily available to you without needing to do a complete application process prior to beginning to obligate the funds. So we're doing an initial substantial approval, substantial application approval, which in that particular case, the part of the application that would need to be approved would be where you identify your leadership team, all the stakeholder representation, you identify a plan for your meeting dates, the times and the purpose of your meetings. And, and that's just a general overview purpose, not a real detailed purpose, but just to give a sense of what your plan throughout the year is going to be. And then uploading your most up-to-date comprehensive needs assessment, otherwise known as the CNA. And then this signed MOU, the document that you're looking at right now, and then it is the principal's responsibility to be able to look at the address book within Grants for Me, within your own specific application, and determine that all the roles and responsibilities of the people that are in there are accurate and that no one has a role of responsibility that shouldn't have. Possibly someone has left the district, left a particular position, and that the people within your district have the correct roles and responsibilities uh, within your school, have the correct roles and responsibilities. Now, sometimes we get the call that you need somebody added to the address book. You need somebody's roles changed. We don't mind helping out, but if we get that call, we're gonna rely on what's in NEO. So NEO has to be updated in order for us to make that change in grants for me. We always have that one source of truth that we go to because we also have to sign off on an assurance to make sure that the information is accurate. And so if we get the call, we're going to ask, has NEO been updated? We're actually going to check NEO to make sure that those positions are indeed um, what you're asking us to do. And then the next thing on there is the principal will initial the assurance that says that the application uh, substantial approval will be acquired before obligating or committing to spend the tier three funds. That's another area that we have seen some confusion around. So we're trying to make sure that we're providing very specific details. You cannot begin to obligate funds until you get substantial approval of the application to spend the funds that have been awarded to your school. And what that means is, and this is an area that still gets some confusion, and so you may ask about it at a later time as well, but when you submit an application for approval, it gets a date stamp on it from that date of submission. If when we review that application, it is ready for substantial approval, that substantial approval date is from the date of submission, not from the date we approve, because we might take up to two weeks to approve it. And we don't want to hold up your funding just because it's in our queue and we haven't had an opportunity. But the caveat is that it has to be in substantial approvable form. So what that means is if you submit an application and instead of being able to provide substantial approval, we've had to send it back for revisions, that's not considered the date that you would get the substantial approval. Again, it has to be substantial approval ready in order for the date that it has been submitted by you 
to be considered the date that you can begin obligating funds. And so we're asking the principal to sign off on that, saying that um, that is understood. All right, I'm gonna keep scrolling. Okay, and then application revisions. So we do ask, if possible, to submit all application revisions at least four weeks prior to obligating funds. This is to ensure that expenses meet the requirements of the program. Any commitment to an expense prior to the approval may be denied. Now, we want to be able to be as responsive as we possibly can, but we cannot always get the reviews done in, in as quick of a turnaround time as some of our schools would like. And what happens is a school might see a particular professional learning opportunity that you want to participate in and you decide, oh my gosh, I wish I would have known this had been, this was going to occur. I would have put that in my application. Oh, well, I'll go in and revise my application. That happens and that's okay, but we have to have a reasonable amount of time in order to do the work that we need to do in order to give you that necessary approval. So again, this memorandum of understanding is highlighting some of these very specific areas that we know can get a little bit tricky and in and in the busyness of the school year can get lost. So again, we're asking that the principal sign off that um, you know we, you understand that. And then the next part here, this colorful blue, is something new that we're offering. Um, I'm going to take a short pause here because I just want to take a sidestep and say that this past year, we participated in May, well, actually in March, April, and May, we participated in a US DOE audit. And the audit focused almost primarily on school improvement, continuous school improvement. And they gave us a lot of wonderful insight that's kind of bleeding into these changes that we're making. And this is, you know, one of them is, you know, we hold our schools and our districts accountable for specific requirements, we need to also be providing professional development and professional learning opportunities in order to meet those requirements. So here's one of them. We have created a year at a glance document that is going to highlight some of the very specific areas that we're going to provide professional learning opportunities. And we're going to provide them in the months that you would likely be working on specific items that are required. So this just gives you kind of an overview of what that is likely going to look like. And I say likely because we have a slight caveat that if there is a greater need or some area that we overlooked that you're saying, Cheryl and Renee, we really need you to focus on this, then we do reserve the right to be able to change as needed. So we wanna highlight that. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about when these are gonna occur every month, a little bit later in the presentation. And then there is a section on here for resources to just be that reminder of what resources are provided from the Department of Education and some of our affiliates. And then the MOU actually outlines the responsibilities of each and every stakeholder from us, the SEA, specifically my department, the ESEA federal programs, my responsibilities to you as a school receiving additional funding and coaching support for continuous school improvement. Then as I scroll down, the superintendent's responsibility, ask the district with which the school resides in, the principal's responsibilities, 
of the principal of a school that is receiving additional funding and coaching for continuous school improvement, what the principal's leadership team should be responsible for. <coughs> Excuse me. And if I keep scrolling, what the main DOE school leadership coach is responsible for so that you know what is the coach's role and responsibility. How can they be a broker of resources? Then, one thing before I go to the very last item that I'm going to highlight is to say that the FY24 coaching comments, the comments the coaches provide you, typically after a meeting, they typically will provide you like an overview of the meeting and maybe some next steps and areas that you're working on. Those are those were done in Dirigo Star, but now they're going to be done directly in Grants for Me. And some of the reasoning behind that is because Grants for Me is our grant new grant management platform. And it is something that we can keep all of those coaching comments. We can keep the MOU, we can keep the CNA, all of it housed right in one location for transparency and easy access by every stakeholder. And it's going to keep that uh, date stamp for all the information. So it's like one package deal. That was another area when we had our USDOE audit. Rather than us needing to go here to get this information and then here to get this information and then somewhere else to get this information, we're really trying to be um, concise and consistent in making it all live in one location. And so the coaching comments, we've been able to work through the platform so that we can keep them in grants for me as well. Then the last thing I want to highlight on the MOU is the consent for continuous school improvement funds. So the principal would consent that the main DOE allocates these continuous school improvement funds on behalf of SAUs to address systemic needs highlighted by all identified schools in compliance with the Maine's model of school support. Keep in mind, these funds are completely separate of any district title funding that you may also be a recipient of and they are not meant to supplant that funding in any way, shape, or form. They are meant strictly to supplement so that on your continuous school improvement journey, you can capitalize on some additional professional learning opportunities for your educators, for your staff at your school that you might not otherwise have been able to take advantage of. And that's all I'm going to highlight on the MOU at this time. But again, you're going to get a copy of it. And then once that document is signed by all, and you can see the signatures there, my signatures, Renee's signatures, superintendent and school principal, it gets housed directly in grants for me, again, where it's transparent and accessible by all. So I'm going to minimize that. And then where was I? I kind of lost my place. Oh, I think I'm done there. All right, I'm going on to the next slide. <laughs> Thank you. So last week, uh, you hopefully received an e-blast from Cheryl through Grants for Me, letting you know that we um, were able to provide the FY24 allocations and the uh, grant award notifications were updated and uploaded. Uh, there's some differentiation between what your allocations might look like. And as I said, there was an e-blast regarding this, but we wanted to make sure that the information was shared with you. If your school was identified as a tier three re-identified school, and that notification was sent out as part of the re-identification or identification process in, uh, in May, it was towards the end of May, and a letter was sent out along with the data uh, PDFs for your school, and you were either categorized as a tier three re-identified school or an unable to exit school. So if you are a re-identified school, you've been allocated the full award for FY24. If your school was identified as a tier three unable to exit school, we've allocated an initial award 
for you to start out the FY24 school year that will help you um, continue on with your school leadership team, paying those salaries and benefits and any initial PD opportunities you might want to explore. And then um, there'll be another round of identifications in the late fall. And if at that time your school has been re-identified, you will be given an increase to that initial allocation. If your school was able to exit tier three status, then your allocation will not be increased, but you still will have access to that initial allocation that you were granted, as I said, just last week, that you'll have access through uh, the FY24 school year. And then we also uploaded the grant award notification that is located on the sections page of your FY24 application. If you click on um, gr grant award notification within that sections page, you're able to see all the terms and conditions of these funds. Uh, there are additional attachments that give you additional information about the funds and then uh, an explanation of the approval process. All right, so as I said previously, we are gonna have a two-step approval process for the grant awards this FY24 school year. So the initial process, which should be relatively easy, and uh, we recognize that the we got the application and awards out later than we intended to, We but our intention over the years is to have that application open prior to uh, August 1st, sometime July, similar to how we do our district ones, and then have the due date for the substantial uh, approval on August 1st. So we left that date the same, but we recognize we're well beyond August 1st at this point. For that substantial approval, again, you have to select your leadership team members within the platform and then identify who they are, what stakeholder representation they hold, determine your meeting dates, times, and purpose of the meetings. And I'm going to pause there for just a moment because I want to address something that you might be thinking, such as, well, how? what if interruptions occur and I can't meet, uh, you know, and this is exactly why we have you determine them ahead of time, because when disruptions occur, and they will inevitably occur, if you've planned out meeting times and dates, that allows you to pivot a lot more smoothly than if you didn't have something planned ahead of time. So that is one of the best practices that we emphasize. And we want you to just put that plan in place, but know that we recognize when disruptions occur and maybe a meeting needs to get canceled, maybe a meeting needs to get shifted, maybe a meeting needs to get postponed. That's gonna happen. But having thoughtful and intentional planning up front is going to prevent it from happening regularly. So you've got to be determining your meeting dates, times, and purpose of the meetings. Have that MOU signed and uploaded on the resources page. Update that address book. Make sure that that assurance is signed. And then attach your most up-to-date up comprehensive needs assessment, otherwise known as the CNA. So that's it. In order for you to get substantial approval to begin obligating these funds, that is what you need to have completed in your application. Now, some people choose to hop right in both feet and say, I'm doing it all. That's perfectly fine. We can do substantial approval and final approval right at the very same time. We are asking, however, if you choose not to do it that way, that the final application approval due date is by uh, October 31st. And with that, that will include your updated CNA with your spring 2023 data, attach additional documents as required in application completion. What might an additional document look like? 
It might be if you are traveling as part of a professional learning opportunity that we you include your travel policy within your district. If you are attending a professional learning conference, then we would ask that that conference agenda and conference overview also get submitted as additional documentation. Again, this just connects all the dots so that everybody involved in this um, awarding and reimbursing of funding can be done as smoothly as possible and if, as efficiently and effectively as possible. So if those documents are there, now Tyra, our management analyst who's, who gets all of the reimbursement requests, she won't have to go looking for it. She won't have to reject the invoice request and then say, please submit additional documentation. We'll already have it right in the platform. Uh, for the final approval, you also need to identify the strengths, the growth areas, and resource inequities, much like the previous applications you have done. You will need to conduct a root cause analysis. Again, another area that is going to get us closer to really being um, connected to evidence-based practices, and it's really getting to the heart of the root areas of problems. Um, and it helps you to, in your world, with as many balls that you're juggling and as many areas of concern that you'd like to address, this helps you kind of streamline that process and get those concerns into a organizational fa fashion so that you know which ones to address first because the likelihood of addressing this concern is going to also impact this concern. And then um, budget. What are you going to spend this money on? Minimum of salaries and benefits for your, your um, school leadership team members. You want to pay them if they're, if they're attending meetings that are up and above their contractual hours, then you can absolutely pay them right out of these funds and you want to make sure that you've got that added into the to the budget all right so just a, a brief overview of the obligation of funds for the fy24 funding uh, the period of performance um, that we've provided in the gan is uh, upon substantial approval, so whenever that substantial approval happens, and those funds need to be obligated by September 30th of 2024, so that's next September, and then needs to be invoiced by December 30th of 2024. Um, the substantial approval date, as we've said previously, needs to be done prior to obligating those funds. So just to kind of go into a little bit more detail, as Cheryl already spoke about, that means contracts can't be signed, so you can't get into a contract with a consultant or a service until after that substantial approval date has occurred. The PD and travel must take place after that substantial approval. And all expenses, just as a reminder, are submitted for reimbursement after the event occurred. So you may book that hotel, you may book the air flight, but we actually can't reimburse for those funds until after that travel and that PD occurred. So that's one thing that we've seen, as um, Cheryl mentioned, Tyra is our management analyst. She'll have to kick back those invoices because we can't reimburse until after the event occurred. Um, again, just to kind of highlight that application revisions at least four weeks in advance, Cheryl talked about that a little bit. Uh, but one of the biggest reasons why we, we chose four weeks is Yes, it does take up to two weeks for us to review the application revision, uh, but an important piece of that is if there's something that needs to be um, edited in that revision, let's say it's missing some information or I need more information to make sure it's an allowable expense, uh, because I do have to vet it through, is it necessary, is it reasonable, is it allowable? If there's missing information and I, I might need more information on that revision, I'll put that feedback in the consultant checklist and then I'll send it back to, to you guys to review that uh, feedback and to make those further edits. That then gives you time to, 
to make those edits and then send it back to me to review. So that's where it can take up to a few weeks, even if I review it, you know, right away, it, it still could take a couple weeks to get that uh, reviewed and, uh, and approved. So we just want to make sure you're never put in a situation where you put money towards something, put money towards a PD or, or a travel or any of those expenses, and then find out after the fact that it wasn't an allowable expense. And then it would be on your district to then pay for that. So we never want to put you in that situation. So it's best to just give us that extra time to review it and approve it um, accordingly. And then again, as we said, this um, is to supplement, not supplant district policies and agreements. Um, so that's where, again, we need to be able to get a lot of that information as we review the application, review some of those budget items to make sure that it's not a, a, a supplanting the district and it's supplementing. An a, a example of this is university and college coursework. Um, yes, this money for tier three um, is for paying for expenses for professional development and university and college coursework is definitely professional development, but we wanna make sure that the district doesn't already have a policy put in place where it agrees to pay for so many credits each year for teachers to take uh, professional development courses. Uh, so we wanna make sure that again, that these funds are paying for something that's above and beyond what the district has already agreed to pay. And that's an example of that. I was just noticing on this slide, we have a two missing on the FY24. It just says FY4. We'll make sure we get that corrected. All right. So FY24 strategic plan application updates continued. So entering those leadership team meetings for the entire school year, those, date, those dates, the start times, the end times, and the purpose of the meeting, this looks a little bit different in the application this year. Not a lot different, but a little bit different from uh, previous years. And then there is a drop down menu, which you uh, drop down, um, what's the word I want? Not menu, but just a drop down capability so that you can add those um, additional dates of meetings, meeting times and purpose of meetings. So you will notice when you go in to update um, your FY24 strategic plan application that it's gonna look a little different. Uh, one of the differences is on the required documents page. Some of it's the same, the CNA, the MOU, uh, but as Cheryl talked about earlier, we are asking for more information to help with the invoicing process. So we've added a section where you can upload other documents. Uh, other documents may be conference information. If you're using that travel, the 5,000 category in your budget, we want that conference information. That will help us determine uh, the amounts for um, travel, whether it's mileage or airfare, your hotel costs, meals, things like that. Um, you will also need to supply your travel policy if using that travel 5,000 category. That again helps us determine do you have a policy in place in your district that allows for a certain amount for meals, certain amount for travel, and or are you going to fall back on the state and federal guidelines? And then other might be, as I mentioned, the, that college and university coursework. So it might be bargaining agreements um, for how much a school district will uh, pay for college reimbursement. Uh, if it says that a teacher can take up to six credits per year um, at a certain rate, those six credits must be paid through the district unless there's a, you know, a cap of some sort. But then again, you would have to supply that information. And then the tier three money could be potentially used for any of those credits above and beyond those six credits. But that's again, where there's a lot of if this, if that. So having all that information beforehand allows us to get all the pieces put in place, really paints that picture, allows us to determine if it's allowable and grant that approval. And again, not put you in a situation where we find out after the fact when it goes through invoicing and Tyra needs to look for that information and then she determines that it wasn't allowable after all. So we're trying to get a lot of those pieces put in place before any of those things happen. And then the next thing you're going to see that's a little different 
is a place to link your agenda in minutes. This allows you to use any platform. You could use your Google Drive uh, account. You could use Dergo Star. Dergo Star offers um, a, an area to do agendas in minutes. You could do a blog. All, there's all, all types of different uh, things that you could use. Here, you would link to that direct platform. Again, that allows for transparency and effective, efficient communication from everyone so that if the, someone from the main DOE or the U.S. DOE wants to look at those, they can just go through our grant and link to all that information uh, in one place. They can look at the MOU. They can look at the CNA. They have all the pieces of it in one place, but allows you the flexibility of using any platform you wish to use for your agenda in minutes. Continuing with the updates, <clears throat> again, this will be something that looks somewhat new, is a root cause analysis. That was one of the areas that I spoke of previously that is part of a evidence-based practice is really getting to the heart of areas of uh, need so that you can focus your funding, you can focus your capacity directly on those areas that will also impact other areas. And so within the application, we have a section where you can really dig into and peel back the layers of areas of focus. So for example, you may have been identified because your math growth and achievement weren't meeting the standards, but that in of itself, if you focus all your attention on that, isn't going to get to the root problems of why students aren't achieving. It really is about unpacking some of that and figuring out how you want to best address that. And we are going to be providing some training around that more specifically as the time, uh, the year continues. And then the creation of SMART goals, that's nothing new. That's something that's also included in our district application. Um, but we want the SMART goals to address the root cause of the identified need, which may look different than the original area of concern that you identified. And that's the whole intent behind doing a root cause is that you're really getting to the root of a problem. It addresses it addresses any identified resource inequities, and it is is a goal that's measured by monitoring tools collected throughout the year, meaning that you're not just collecting data at the end point and hoping that whatever you were doing for an intervention was working. And then coaching comments, as we mentioned earlier, have now been moved to grants for me. So as we mentioned earlier, we're really hoping to uh, be able to support you throughout the school year um, on your continuous school improvement journeys. So we're putting together monthly meetings. And as Cheryl pointed out in the MOU, we do have this year at a glance uh, calendar. The, the items may change, the topics may change, but we're hoping to be able to support you uh, in various aspects of um, the continuous improvement cycle, which Cheryl's going to talk about in a moment, uh, but these are some of that the key areas. What we also want is really feedback from the field. So when you're looking at this and you're going through uh, your leadership team meetings, if there's something that you feel should be brought up at a meeting, we really encourage you to to reach out and uh, let Cheryl and I know so that we can incorporate it into these monthly meetings. Because if it's something that's um, maybe an issue for you or a, a hindrance for you, that could be going on for other schools as well. And we want to be able to address that and give the uh, the proper supports and, and pull together some resources and, and really help you through that. So please um, reach out to us at any point. You see something uh, on a month that's coming up that could be addressed and we will um, work that in. And as I said, the next uh, piece of it is Cheryl's going to talk about the continuous improvement cycle and how this all kind of fits into it. Thank you, Renee. So your continuous improvement cycle does include everything that we've talked about, starting with one, and we are trying to really streamline processes so that the connecting of the dots 
seems obvious rather than having you feel like it's just another hoop for you to jump through in order to access federal funds. It really is meant to be a continuous improvement cycle, which by the way, every school should be on this journey, not just those of you sitting on this call today. We should all be on continuous improvement cycles. Um, and you're just the fortunate ones that get the benefit of having the support of a main DOE leadership coach to help sit shoulder to shoulder with you and guide you through this process and additional funding devoted directly to your school for this work. So the first thing is to create or update your comprehensive needs assessment and analyze the aggregated data on uh, continuous progress monitoring and pivot when needed. Now, one of the areas that we've heard loud and clear is there's too much time needed to be devoted to collecting the data rather than having the time to actually look at the data, dig deep into it, analyze it. And so we're working at the department level on ways that that data can already get collected for you. If we're collecting it in other areas of the department, how can that transfer into the CNA so that you have the data and all you need to worry about is looking at it aggregating it, disaggregating it, and analyzing it for next steps. Conduct that root cause analysis, get to the heart of a problem um, so that you can really have that long-term sustainability of the impact of um, addressing it. Then create that strategic plan, which is part, which is essentially the application. So we have very strategically made the application for the awards of these funds into the strategic plan itself so that it is not a separate document required, that it is exactly what you're doing. You're telling us how you intend to spend the, these funds and why you've gotten to that point of what you're going to do. Setting goals, selecting research and evidence-based interventions, one of the areas that Renee spoke of earlier is some of the resources that we'll share with you so that you can continue to build up the tools in your tool belt as far as knowing what works, what doesn't work, so that you're not just spending for yourself. You've actually got some evidence around interventions that really have proven successful. Then determine the action steps. Decide what resources are needed for implementation, selecting a selection and progress monitoring, and then acquire any of those required resources. And again, that's what these funds are for and implement those action steps. So that in a nutshell is your continuous improvement cycle. And then it, it's exactly that. It's a cycle. It continually goes around and around. We pivot when necessary. Again, those inevitable disruptions will occur, but if you have a well thought out plan and you're ready, you're more likely to be able to pivot seamlessly when the disruptions do occur. Absolutely. And as Cheryl was talking about that comprehensive needs assessment, the CNA, um, and I know a lot of people ask, and I've seen the chat, you know, is there a template? Um, is there an update? Uh, we do offer a template, but it is it is just that, a template. And we can drop that into the chat here in a moment. I can look that up for you. Uh, but it is on our main DOE website. But if that doesn't work for you, and we hear that sometimes, well, it just doesn't work for me, then make it your own. As long as it captures all the data from your school and you're able to, as Cheryl said, aggregate it, disaggregate it, and really deeply analyze it, then that's a CNA that works for you. And that's what it really needs to be because it is more than just a data collection tool. It really needs to be a, a, a tool that you use for systematic, systematic and ongoing um, data analysis. It helps you determine your strengths, growth areas, resource inequities, gaps in your school and our district. And it needs to be a living document. It shouldn't be something that you visit once a year just to kind of check that box. It really needs to be updated throughout the year and not just updated with state assessment data, but all data, um, all the data that your teachers 
and your staff are collecting throughout the school year, whether it's behavioral um, attendance, um, uh, curriculum assessments, surveys, any of that information and update that regularly. And it really should play a key role in developing your strategic plan for continuous school improvement. Because as she said, uh, the strategic plan really is what's gonna help you pivot when things um, aren't going as, as they need to be. Um, so if you're finding mid-year that uh, your goals aren't being met for whatever reason, you can do a root cause analysis to determine why and then revise that strategic plan uh, so that you can move forward. And that helps to bolster and build on your strengths and address those growth areas and gaps and help you to reach your goals for your school. Renee, before I move to the next slide, do you want to mention the little resource that's on this slide? Can you see it? Yes, yes, thank you. Um, when we presented, Cheryl and I presented at the Educator Summit last week, which uh, was wonderful. I hope you all had an opportunity to attend. Uh, but we did a much larger presentation on what we just shared with you about the strategic plan and the design process. And this was one of the resources we shared. And it's a needs assessment guidebook. Um, it's found within one of the resources that we have attached to our uh, Grants From Me platform within the strategic plan for FY24. Um, and it's an evidence-based resource to help you with your CNA. And it gives you a lot of, of tips and, and uh, helpful information on how to really conduct a useful uh, CNA and how to uh, collect that data. So we will make sure that you have access to that as well. Thank you. All right, so we have a poll here. So as I said, we are gonna be providing those professional learning meetings and you're gonna actually get an opportunity to sit shoulder to shoulder with your coach and have uh, access to resources and the professional learning opportunity, and then your coach can help you think through where are you at in that journey re relative to whatever the topic is. And if you're not where you want to be or where you should be, how do you make that forward movement there? How do you implement um, various things over the time to make that forward movement? So we want to know what is the best day of the week to me and what is the best time of the week, so time of the day to me, so that we can really try to honor because we know how busy the life of a principal can be. And we want to be able to honor any time of day that would work best for you know the largest population. So we're going to do a quick poll. And Renee, I could, are you are you putting the poll out or would you like me to? Yeah, I'm, I'm doing it right now. I was just going to say I created it. I hope to be so that you can uh, select multiple choices, but I'm fairly new to poll. So I'm not sure how that's going to work, but you do have all the options in front of you to be able to choose both the day or days and the times. And you can already see it being populated. We'll keep it running until it starts to slow down. It's almost like a horse race, <laughs> watching the lines move. Come on, come on, come on, <laughs> cheer them on. And the great thing um, is we will be recording the sessions. So if you do miss a meeting or if the meeting date and time doesn't work for you, we will record it. Um, and then you can always ask follow-up questions after watching the recording and we'll be sure to respond. All right, I think our response is starting to slow. We'll give it another 10 seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. I'll close the poll. Thank you very much for participating. That'll give us some good insight in order to move forward.
All right. So at this point, we're going to close the session, uh, the presentation down. I'm going to stop sharing. And at this point, you have an opportunity to ask any questions.